Good evening. Welcome to the. <laughs> the, the voice has spoken. <laughs> Welcome to the uh, Sunderland Select Board meeting. Today is Monday, July twenty seventh, twenty twenty, and um, <clears throat> actually, our first item will be to um, approve our minutes from our last meeting. Mm, let me just see if they're attached here. Uh, we have. Do we have the minutes attached? Uh, I think I might have. I don't see them. Yeah. I can pull them up on the screen, or we can do the. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Can you screen. Get, screen's fine. Yep. We can just pull them up. We'll check them out and then approve those. I feel like we should have background music. <laughs> That's the same font we get on the printed version. Yeah. Amazing. Look at that. Do, 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 and these were from our meeting two weeks ago from July 13th because we are on our summer schedule, at least in theory. So do we have a motion on the minutes? Uh, so moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Those are our minutes. <clears throat> and then next up, I'm just going to reshuffle the order slightly and do the Mount Toby drinking water protection conservation restriction. Um, and apparently, um, we also, while we voted to move the money for the, the CPA and um, general approval of the, the concept, we actually need a separate vote from the select board to approve it. Um, and it had to be notarized so that we could um, get this done. And, um, and uh, if Nancy, if you can just kind of give folks a quick reminder about what this project is about. We just need, oh. Hey now. Oh, we've stopped recording. I did not do that. And it, we, do you all still have that little red dot? Under it, rec, yes. Yeah, yeah, and it says recording. Who do I? Oh, we're back. Nancy must have special. <laughs> Whoop. Are we getting a house tour, Nancy? <laughs> um, yes, a little bit. I was moving closer to our modem. Because um, I lost you, and I wasn't sure if it was you or me. Okay. Okay. So you want me to give my spiel? So you, can you give a give the elevator pitch for the the project, Nancy, for a sec? Okay. So this is just um, legal language to spell out the details of how the forty acres that the water district is going to own on Cross Mountain Road are going to be protected in perpetuity. And the Conservation Commission is going to hold that conservation restriction, even though the water district will own the property. So basically, um, allowed uses will be what they call passive recreational activities, hiking, fishing, hunting, horseback riding, cross country skiing, um, basically non motorized recreational activities. And if permission is granted by the water district, could also be snowmobiling and mountain biking on designated trails and even camping. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. Keep going. Just keep yeah. going? Okay. It yeah. And um, forestry will also be permitted as long as there is a forest stewardship plan. That um, makes sense. Yeah. And they file those with, um, usually with you guys, as I recall, right? Because exactly. I remember seeing those. So, yep. So that's it. Just need you to uh, give your official stamp of approval. And I think this is technically because the Conservation Con Commission through the town has to hold the restriction, right? As right. far as why we're voting. So we just need a, a, um, a motion to vote to approve acceptance of the conservation restriction. How about that? Does that sound? Yep, that's all we need well. Yeah, so. I'll make that motion. Yeah, so we have a second. Okay. Uh, all those in favor? 
Hi. Hi. All right, there you go. Thank you. So easy, right. See how easy that was? Nice to see you. Nice to see you as well. <laughs> Appreciate all your help with this project. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thanks. All right, next up on our agenda is our bi-weekly, hmm. hello, Lori, COVID-19 state of emergency update. Hi there. How are you? Good, how are you? Good, thanks. So we received notice that MEMA is doing a community PPE allotment and the pickup was last week and or today. I went over to GCC, which is where the pod is located last week, and they were giving us 6,200 KN95 masks, 6,200 regular masks, 625 shields, and 80 pairs of goggles, which will not fit in a Kia Soul. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I asked for help. Um, Steve and uh, Eric and Eric went today to pick up our allotment and when he got there they he found out that they were giving us an extra 96 face shields yeah. so he delivered 10 to Cliffside, 10 to Amherst Grove, 10 to Sugarloaf Estates and the rest of them went to the town hall. So that is my update for PPE. Um, I'm also aware of the governor's August 1st new travel order with folks coming in from the states other than the eight exempt states and wonder how this is going to affect college kids coming in yeah yep. so. uh, just to, if i could just interrupt if, if you're not talking if you can just mute your mic that'd be great thanks because we're getting a little little feedback in there sometimes thanks So that's my update for today. Hmm. Thank you. Um, and kind of that, that, that offers us a perfect segue into return of college students, I would say, right there. <clears throat> so what, um, what do we have going on on that, Jeff? So I reached out to the apartment complexes last week just to check in, see how this year was different than last year. Almost all of them are reporting um, close to 100% capacity. They're kind of juggling things as some people who have signed leases are asking if they can get out of them because they're not coming. and. Um, there are lots of people still looking for housing in the area. Um, I did not necessarily specify, you know, students. Um, so I, I don't want to claim that it's a, all these places are 100% occupied by students because that, that's certainly not right. the case. But you know, I asked what other precautions that they were taking. They said extra cleanings, um, sanitizations, sort of trying to keep um, common areas clean there for those that have uh, September 1st or August 21st move-in date they're trying to um, stagger the times so you don't have you know hundreds of cars and lots of people gathering together and pushing yeah. by each other in small hallways and, and they're trying to um, think strategically about how move-in would work um, you know, have had a conversation with the, the town manager in Amherst about their approach. Um, you know, he wrote a letter to uh, Chancellor Subhaswamy um, outlining some of the things that, that Amherst was requesting um, be incorporated into the plan. And um, I've set up a, a meeting tomorrow um, with, with myself and um, I, Caitlin, and the, the <laughs> Board of Health Chair and uh, the Police Chief with the Executive Director of External Relations and Community Affairs, I think, or? Yep. Uh, okay, um, Tony and, and the off-campus Housing Director, Sally Lenowski, uh, just to understand what their plans are, you know, ensuring that 
how, however they incorporate um, off-campus housing in Amherst as, as far as communications and my understanding is that they're all students are going to be signing the campus agreement regardless of where they're living um, oh. trying to understand make sure that that extends beyond the uh, town boundary of Amherst as well um, and that they're treating all communities where off-campus housing is uh, the same way. Kate, Caitlin, you have any questions about that? No, I don't have any questions. Um, I think we're all on the same wavelength. Um, you know, I, I think it's going to be very similar to uh, what there was an article in the paper uh, from Amherst perspective. And I think that we have very similar questions. Um, you know, we want to we want to get some answers from Amherst on I mean, from UMass to make sure that they're going to be treating the off campus students the same, holding them to the same standards and responsibilities as they are the on campus students. As far as uh, signing the pledge uh, that they're going to follow the uh, rules and regulations regarding social distancing and mask wearing. And we also want to discuss a little bit about um, the reporting of the positive cases at, and such. We have not had a, uh, an active case in our town since May. And I, that's a wonderful speech, but it's going to change as soon as school starts. Yeah. Because everything's bringing with them everything from their own towns. And then we're also going to have the elementary school starting. But I, you know, we have an amazing framework in place. Um, so, so, Caitlin, hey, Caitlin. Yes. yes. So, if, if a student at UMass becomes has a positive test, they go into quarantine. And Correct. There's a, so, my my my, uh, and again, one of my questions is, they they have sep they have separate housing for those quarantine areas. So someone in a local apartment comes down with a positive test, where do they quarantine? Are they, if they're a student, do they go to UMass and they do to go to onsite quarantine? Well, so, oh, that, that's I think that's a question we got they, at ask tomorrow as well. Because if you're saying you're treating off campus same as on campus, I, and then how could they force a student that's off campus to go on campus for a quarantine? Well, that's what I mean. We're not, we can't, it might actually be, it might actually be safer for everybody if they don't go back onto campus. If they self-quarantine, in other words, at home? Quarantine at home, because yeah. if they go back to campus, then they're, in essence, you know. I'm spreading uh, it there. And we don't want to even put them in that hotel or whatever it is that they're supposed they're you know quarantining in for the on-campus people. So. So Jeff, would you ask that question tomorrow, please? Yeah. I think that's a valid question. The only thing is, is we don't we are, as a town aren't going to know of positive COVID cases unless we are told. Right. Hmm. Public health. We don't know. It won't necessarily. We only know if it gets entered into the Maven system, or it, it, unless, so or unless our public health nurse gets told directly by a doctor or by UMass. So right. that's where we need to open a line of communication and ask them to call our public health nurse to let the, us know so that we can have A, accurate statistics, and B, we can follow up with the contact tracing because that actually becomes our problem e equally as UMass's problem because right. so these are apartment cases. So when you talk about contact tracing, I will just tell you a personal experience of contact tracing. Not my person, but someone I know very, very closely. The person, uh, the day before, let's say on a Tuesday, 
had a, received notification that they had received a negative COVID test. Mm -hmm. the, following, the following day, through contact tracing, they found out that they were exposed mm -hmm. to someone with COVID. They went for a test that day, so less than 24 hours later, and they came back through contact tracing because they would not have gone to get a test. But 24 hours later, they had a positive COVID response. Mm -hmm. So the contact tracing... Mm -hmm. If it if it if it's followed, that's the hard part. Is making everybody to get everybody on the same page. It does work. Sure, and that's if they give you the names. I mean, they may not even give you the right names of people they right. were with. Right. right. So and communication is going to be really important then. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the other thing is is well, with college kids though, you're they understand. I think it was the older people are more reluctant, but I think the college kids understand why. Um, and stuff. So I, I'm not worried about that. I think we're just, just getting the information from the university might be tough. And I don't mean they're reluctant to, I mean, they might be busy. So we right. need to open up an easy way, uh, email, you know, something real easy. We make it easy for them. Um, and, and I think we can do that. And I've actually worked through my former profession with Sally, um, on education through the DA's office and stuff. So, you know, we already have a relationship. So, I, <laughs> so you know, I, I don't know if that's going to help or not, but maybe. Do, do we need to roll out our mobile sign at all with any, is there any kind of messaging that would be useful to put on that at all as they start to start to move back? I mean, it may not be, I don't know. I just. Well, um, Jeff and I can bounce that around with, with the chief. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, I, I love having it. I think it's a great thing to have for us to give to, uh, <laughs> for us. <laughs> the lights went off. If you do something, I think that's great. Okay. But really, it's communication, because we don't, we don't know any of the cases that come through our town unless somebody tells us. Right, right, right. So, that that's that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did good getting us this meeting, so I think it'll work. And it, just to tie it back to to another point about the governor's orders and enforcement. I mean, what's going to happen right now? There's a limitation, I think, of 25 people indoors if if there's a a party. And I'm not saying this is just students, but um, yeah. you know, how, how is that going to be enforced, even if it's quiet and there's nothing else going on, if it's just a large gathering, um, how does that happen? And what's the communication back to the, to the university if it is students? I mean, do they, should they be informed? How does that, you know, th those types of things? I think we just want to have an open line of communication with them and start those conversations. Um, that's why it's important to have with us because to tell you the truth, that's a ticketable offense, but that's not an that's not a way to get into a house. Now I'm putting my old hat on from my former profession. You can't you can't go into a house for a civil offense. Right. So technically, we can't unless there's a complaint or some type of criminal offense. You can't get into a house. So they can say, yeah, we got 25 people here. <laughs> you yeah, know. You know, you can't get in, uh, but you could let the, the school know, hey, look, we know there was more than 25 people. And if we have a good relationship, we can talk to them and say, you know, there might be some administrative consequences with school or please let them understand that we're just here to promote health and safety. You know, we don't want to sit a cop at the end of the driveway counting people if they come out from the party. <laughs> So along you know, those, I was going to say along those lines, Caitlin, is there information that we should, as a town, convey to the larger property owners uh, that would be helpful to the Board of Health that they could well, convey yeah. to their renters? Yes, there. The, also, the the rent, the renters. We don't have a registration in our town right. because we we felt we couldn't um, enforce it with. You know, uh, Amherst has much more, uh, had many more people. I don't know what now, but, you know, to enforce that registration. 
Uh, but so our renters are not going to come to us or we aren't going to be told, hey, we're renting to UMass students. So we don't really know until we get complaints who's renting to UMass students. But for Sugarloaf and for Cliffside, we can definitely print up something and give it to them. Um, but they're not the ones that are going to have the 25 people parties. It's the house. No, right, yeah, right, rightly so. But they, they still represent the opportunity to reach out to people who are coming in town, either from out of state or new to town. And just a reminder about, you know, what it is, what, what, the, what the policy is. The policy is if you're testing that and conveying, be, I'm just looking to be proactive. That might be good for the electronic board. Yeah. Remember no groupings. There you go. Right. You know, just a, a list of reminders. Yeah, we could put that. Um, please be careful. Or just, you know, remember your safety. Remember social distancing, you know. So we we could think of something to, to, that could be good for the board. That, that it, it, seems, our, it seems like in this phase with the reporting structure the way it is, our best bet is to the ask for help and encourage involvement model. Yeah. Like yeah. Just just remind everybody, hey, we are truly in this together. Yeah. yeah. Just like our Mexican policemen, you know, I've we've really worked hard with the police, the police officers, and the chief that we do not ticket. Ticketing is our last yep. resort. We don't ticket. We, we have, ma you know, we have the police officers with extra masks. We have the, the, the education. We have the, you know, just anything but ticketing. So right. That's what we're here for. Rather focus on behavior rather than enforcement in that respect. Yep. So, so David, <laughs> and we hope I know Jessica said she needs to leave um, by a certain time because she has a meeting. Oh, but, that's right. so, but still on the COVID conversation, does the school, I mean, you know, the elementary school, how, how does that look? Greg, Peter, Jessica? Are, 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 do, you got, can, do you guys have concerns that you'd like to address with the town? We don't vote until August 4th um, to know right. which model we'll be reopening with. Um, per state guidelines, we are, the, the district is developing three different models. I think you've already heard about this. Full return, yeah. fully remote instruction, or hybrid. We don't know until August 4th what we'll be doing. Um, we do have a joint Union 38 uh, meeting tomorrow night to discuss it. I, 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 we, we saw the... The, the draft of the plan it looks like it's been it's been con it, there's been a lot of conversation and thought been put into the plan and probably now probably you're reaching out to the parents and the stakeholders trying to get an idea what what they're thinking about also right now right did you get updates today there's a, a new draft no I haven't seen that one yet yeah and um, and some survey results uh, one positive thing with financial impact, financial implications is that um, only 15% of families say they will need busing. Huh. Wow. Sounds to me like we won't be needing to add any buses if we yeah. physically reopen. Wow, good. Well, I, I, we were talking earlier, I talking earlier with Peter, and I just want to make the, you know, the schools aware um, about PPE, about in, in I, I'm sure that's going to be concerned also, you know, students and, and staff and, and faculty and such. But uh, Burkhoff, the Franklin Regional Council of Government, is both purchasing PPE to sell that cost to all, all in town. So if, there, if, there's any, if there's anything about PPE, buying it or whatever, um, that I, I wouldn't hesitate talking to the Burkhoff but they, they, they should, and because and, they, what we, what the FERCOC try to do is, is prevent Deerfield buying stuff and Sunderland outbidding them. So the, the FERCOC are just going to buy in bulk. I'll make sure Darius knows about that. Thanks. Okay. Um, well, Caitlin, here, if, if I, I may. have a question. Um, the, the state guidelines, the protocols for um, closing a school in case of known COVID exposures um, require that Darius communicates with the board of the town board of health before before announcing a closure. Um, Caitlin, can you tell us anything about sort of 
how, how nimble the Board of Health can be in terms of response. What does that actually look like? Because I don't know. Okay, well, it, yeah, the notification comes to the Board of Health, but it's actually our public, we employ a public health nurse. Right. And so, I mean, it comes to the Board of Health, but it, it really goes to the public health nurse. But she's four and, hours a week, is that right? Well, she is, we employ her for Sunderland. And she, um, she's actually employed for a couple of different towns, by different towns. But um, we are in contact with the nurse manager for Frontier Regional, um, the entire school district, who is in contact with the nurses. There are two new nurses in the district now. Um, I think it's Waitley and Sunderland has new nurses. So uh, protocols are being put into place right now because there's going to be things like um, if kids come down with a fever, in school, um, let alone positive tests, you know, so what to do during school time. Um, so those protocols have to be hammered out because we want them to be the same across all the schools, including Frontier Regional High School. Um, they notify, so we get a call, but it, it goes through the Board of Health, but it goes immediately to our public health nurse. Um, and that'll, that goes, um, and and so that would then be entered into the state system. It'll actually be entered in also by the pediatrician or whoever got the positive t test. And then our public health nurse does the following. With regard to school closures, that is a bigger decision. Then that doesn't, that's not just the Board of Health decision. So it's serious, and he's supposed to consult with you before actually announcing it, and also Desi, the State Board of Ed. So I'm wondering what? if he finds out, like, at, I don't know, 7 o'clock at night, that there's been an exposure, will he be able to communicate with you and Desi? I, I, this is one of my many concerns. Oh, yeah. And, and because, it, of course, um, he'll be able to communicate with everybody. And um, we're always available and we always have you know um because it's going to have to be a you know a decision that goes to the superintendent as well as um you know as well as uh the you know the public health nurse is going to uh give her guidance but it's really a decision that the school makes on whether it closes or not and I'm sure he's going to consult with the school board and everybody else. But yeah, he'll be able to he'll be able to get in contact with Board of Health and the public health. If I may briefly, and, sorry. Yeah. Um, all I was going to say is, uh, you asked uh, if the school committee had things to share. Uh, because of the nature of the way that the COVID impacts the town, I would definitely encourage anyone in the town. Uh, who has concerns about the schools reopening to attend the school committee meeting. So it's Excellent not just point. parents, uh, but we'd love to hear what you have to say. If you can't make the meeting, our emails are on the school website. We'd really like to hear from the public. This is a complicated decision. I know a lot of effort went into what they've done so far, so appreciate it. All right, David, the only other thing I would add is that, as Jessica said, we got a bunch more information today, and I'll send that on to you guys as soon as we're done here, um, that included real specific plans for like, you know, some sort of hybrid opening, which seems like it's very likely to be the case, um, and also results from a parent survey that would give you information about, uh, as Jessica said, the, the transportation requirements, which uh, basically the school is going to be asking parents uh, whenever possible to provide their own transportation to kids to the school because that's the safest way to do it. Um, and also uh, in terms of the percentage of uh, kids that the parents are not comfortable with a kid coming back to, you know, learning at the school. And it seems like that number is around 10, 15%, something like that. Okay. Um, but there's, uh, there's a bunch of real specific stuff in the, in the plan that I'll send around. We just got it this afternoon. Uh, our next meeting is a joint meeting tomorrow at uh, 5 p.m. Um, 
and I think you go to the calendar on the town's website and it'll have the, 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 the information about how to join in. Uh, and then as Jessica said, on the 4th of August, we have to vote to approve a plan. Uh, it also seems like we'll have to have just a meeting just for our own elementary school. He's doing this with each of the elementary schools just to review where we stand financially in all this, because there's obviously a whole lot hanging there that nobody knows still at this point. So I'm not sure when that'll be in August yet. It hasn't been scheduled, just that it's coming. Okay. I'll, I'll send this stuff to you, email it to you shortly. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Appreciate it, Peter. Thanks, Jessica. All right. We have any, uh, anything else on that, on that topic at all any, from anyone? Well, I think the discussion, if I could, Mr. Chair, illustrates mm -hmm. just how yes. many threads there are in this tapestry yeah. s help, helping with a decision. But as Tom has pointed out in the past, that decision also requires some awareness of what a response would end up being. And that right. seems to be the point that we're at. So to uh, echo Jessica's point, if you have concerns, it's really important to participate in the school committee side and to Jeff Kay's point that we need to stay in touch with all of the people around us, all of the, all of the agencies that can provide both impact and information sharing. It's complicated and we have to just stay together on it. Just keep plugging away. Communication is going to be paramount through this whole process. Right. Thank you. All right. Thanks. <clears throat> All right. Um, our next topic is the town administrator evaluation and goals. <coughs> it's hard to believe that it's been that long already. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, go ahead, um, Is there any more COVID-19 uh, information that we need to discuss tonight? I think we're all done with COVID specific items. The, okay. if I could oh, any go ahead. Uh, there, I mean, the, the only other related thing is the review the outdoor dining and immer uh, restaurant okay. grocery. It's not, it's yeah. related to the, the pandemic. Um, so I, I don't know if, you're, okay. if, what, if, if you what, want to try and take that now or. Yeah, we can do that now. Yeah, why don't we do that? I'm sitting outside of the road. I know, I saw you there, yeah, I could tell. So yeah, that way, you know, you can pop off afterwards. So, <clears throat> um, this is our outdoor, review our outdoor dining and restaurant grocer emergency orders. And I think this was just on, on the agenda because when you signed them, you said we want to review it by August 1st. August 1st, right. And yep. this is the last meeting before August 1st. Um, I, I have reached out to, to some um, restaurants on this and sort of the universal response was e even if we were in phase four and, and we're in the new normal, um, we lost a bunch of months where we couldn't have any business and uh, anything that the town could do to help support us that that's safe and isn't putting people in danger um, would, would be greatly appreciated for their businesses. So that, that's the perspective of, of the restaurants. So Jeff, in that context, is, is in the context of the order, we had a review here for August 1st, and clearly it helps, and we're hearing that from the businesses. Was there any discussion about expanding any of it or just extending the current? Because I could certainly go for extending the current, and we could make it a 10-1 a check-in, right? Get another yep. couple of months and just for discussion's sake. Um. You know, I, I don't think that there there has been any discussion about expanding it. I don't know what else we might be able to do um, that that isn't already done. I think that right. you know we're allowing outdoor dining. Um, the gr I. I I, I can group? look into what other options are available for expanding, but I, I, that was not part of the discussions. Um, well, it's, it seems like the original order allowed for some real flexibility for the common bits, the restaurants, the grocers, 
And if we're here now in our, in our discussion is centered around simply uh, the review for August 1st, it doesn't seem, it says the, the item three says this order is reviewed no later than August 1st if the state of emergency and this order are still in effect at that time. So it seems procedurally to me that we would want to extend this order, the item three of this order to a date certain in the future and allow the rest, allow those exceptions to simply continue. Yeah, I would agree. It, it makes sense. And I think, um, especially with the way the weather's going, I think you mentioned October, that's probably maybe we bump it out to October 1st as a, as a date. You can make it October 1st, you can make it November 1st, and maybe we happen to be yeah. in sync by then with, you know, the next phase of openings and restriction relaxations uh, with the state. But again, the order itself seems to cover what the business, um, the town business owners were looking for. We haven't heard much feedback saying, please, we need to do X, Y, or Z more. Right. And the order here is as of effectively, you know, this week. Tom, what do you think? I, I, I was going, when you started talking like that, Scott, I, I was thinking maybe you were looking at more long-term changes of business plan altogether. You know? I'd actually, I'd actually be, if I could, uh, I, I'd actually oh, yeah. be interested in getting feedback from the business owners about making some of these things permanent if it's helpful. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and I think we need to talk, that's where I thought you were going, Scott, because, and again, I, I think that that's, they, they, may, they may have not looked at it as part of their business plans before, right. but now they found. And again, I think there's some, some of the things that they're doing, like there are certain places now that if you order out, you, you, you call them up and before you have to go in, you have to wait in line. To yep. Big prop. Now you, they say, okay, your number car 84, you come up there, the, the person comes out and you say you're 84. They go, okay. And they go in, take your bag, put your car in your bag and away you go. Yep. You've already paid for everything. You right, know, right. So, full curbside. So, so different. And, and I would just like, you, you know, if, if you go to some, for instance, wagon, wagon wheel up in Gill, they, they spread now on the side of their business. They, they've got picnic tables up and down and, and it's always full and it looks that, I mean, before the people were eating inside, but now they, they appear to like to eat outside. So they may right. want their business plan. And I thought that's where you were going. And we may want to look at that going forward. Yeah, I was going to go there, Tom, the action tonight. We didn't have, I, my feeling is we needed to do two things. So I was reach out to the businesses and say, what elements, if any, would be permanent, would you be interested right. in? Secondly, yeah. how do, is there any tension with respect to current bylaws? But from tonight's action, it looks like we need to do at least a basic extension to a date certain in the future. But I'm with you about, about that permanent review. And it's Business is going to change. Right. And, 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 and I, when I look at it, Scott, I look at it and say, A, you know, we hadn't, you know, businesses may not have thought that this was a viable alter, or they didn't. And people, people may change. People may change how they want to do business. So. I, I just right. think I just think it's a po I just think it's a positive thing um, to go to go by and to see people outside um, to see the rest you know the business is still trying to make it happen. I just think those are all positive things. So we should, like you said, I, I make go to November November first. That way you get through the fall, and and then we go from there. And, yeah, and especially and, with respect to outdoor dining, I think I think that's something that we've kind of given short shrift to you know, throughout the whole state. And Fair point. If I could just jump in, I, I think that the restaurant grocers might be more difficult than outdoor dining. I think outdoor dining is, is zoning and that's a, a conversation that the planning right. board can have. But I think there is the, the food code and I think that you know, the governor's orders made certain exceptions on a time limited basis, but um, as far as packaging and labeling that once that order disappears, uh, businesses may find it 
prohibitively expensive to do some of the things that are required from, by mm -hmm. the food group, but it's I, we can explore it and, and confirm whether or not that's true. Yeah, uh, right. yeah there's there's uh, anybody who pays attention to the, you know local or regional news knows that you know where the where the where the pinch lies and what adaptations have been made and how difficult it currently is. But that said, there's also a fair amount of innovation that's happening in those, in, in those arenas. And people may want to do something along those lines over a longer term. So uh, I'd make a motion to extend this, um, extend this emergency order, reauthorize the emergency order mm -hmm. so it extends to November 1st, 2020. Okay. Do a second. Uh, second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Three that, to zero on an extension through November 1st. That, that said, we have homework to do, and that is reaching out to people who are participating with these inside of this um, new framework and ask for their input about what may or may not make sense on a permanent basis. And that includes the Board of Health, zoning, you know, general business. How do we go about this? How do we help? Right. Like we're all going to have to think a little bit differently on a more permanent basis. Correct. Yep. All right. Any other, any other comments on the uh, outdoor dining and restaurant grocery emergency orders? And I know um, one of our establishments been in town that has been doing the grocery thing, especially if anybody follows them on Instagram, you'll see all that information out there. So, mm -hmm. all right. Um, all right, well, so thank that, you guys. that's probably it, Caitlin. Don't All right, call, call, call me, okay? Or All right, send thanks. Me. Thanks, thank guys. You. Appreciate it. Thanks. Bye-bye. Right. All right, so, so back to our town administrator and evaluations and goals. So we had our review with our town administrator, and um, <clears throat> we were discussing some of the goals. And I think, um, and, and if I'll just kind of go over it generally and then if you have any other feedback Jeff hop in there or anybody else um, and we also talked about our goals too and I think we've got a lot of common goals especially with respect to internal procedural improvements and things like that I think that's one of the things that we focused on there um, and also like things like our budget spreadsheets and trying to make that easier for all of us to understand because that is that is growing to be a large behemoth um, and that was one of the one of the important things that we talked about. Um, and I, I didn't, you know, the one thing I forgot to do was bring my notes for that. But um, uh, does anybody have any other like feedback they want to pop in there at all? Or uh, Je Jeffrey, I, I'm just sorry that your first six months have been. So I mean, yeah. So all those uh, all the things that we talked about are kind of taking a second second uh second fiddle right now to to the covid and and making things happen so i it, it's it's difficult it's difficult not being here with your staff uh the staff of the town um so i don't i don't think this past six months or so have have been a fair have given you a fair opportunity to 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 show your all your strengths, let's put it that way, because Very um, true. Our, our 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 all of our time has, which we find unfortunately, uh, like a school <laughs> roof could fall down, um, and and so I, I just I just want to say that when when we get out of this, um, I think it'd be a fairer judge of your of your first six months, so. But sort of I personally, I think you've done a you've done a, a good job. I like your outreach to the community, the, the talking to people, you're talking to the surrounding communities. All of those are very positive. Thank you, Jeffrey. I would agree. It's been very so, appreciated. If I, if I could weigh in, you mm -hmm. know, the, the the notion that coming in under a, a review and goal setting in a in a normal uh, with a normal backdrop. Um, is it possibly the best way, Tom? I think uh, it can it can be said that in the time of crisis, right? Your 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 real your your real skill set uh, mm. and ability to interact 
uh, is on display much more so than what could be masked in a normal skill in a normal time. That's and true. both Jeff and, and, and the town's uh, long established and uh, staff have, have done really, really well in this particularly difficult period. There's a lot of things that have gotten done that are basically normal business at the same time right. in the storm. And I think that's a, that's a, that's a really good display of both what, what Jeff has brought, uh, but also the resiliency of, of the town staff and its resources. So I would say, uh, you know, keep up the good work and let's hope for, <laughs> let's, let's hope for a normal sometime. <laughs> yep. I would agree. And, and you just basically came in and got thrown right into the frying pan. So, you know, yeah, he's a great the only guy job. Who can set up, only guy who can set up these meetings, so we can't let him go now. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And, and, and you through the got the password. It's that's exactly right. right. Yep. Not giving it up. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and through that, we've still been managing to get some other things done, which is great too. So, yeah, exactly. You know, we're plugging along, <clears throat> and it, it's been it's been a pleasure to work with you so far, Jeff. So, thank you. So how's, how's the town doing, Jeff? I mean, this is the part where you might get to speak, if I could, Mr. Chair. No, that's right. I think we'll slide right into, before we do the select board, we'll go right over to the town administrator updates. Bam. Sure. So I guess I'll start start by echoing that, that I appreciate the, the praise, but, you know, really it's, it's the staff that right. knew what was happening, had plans, um, you know, for the the MD, the police chief, the fire chief, the town hall staff, the clerk, um, Cindy. I mean, it was, you know, they. Again, I <laughs> I got thrown into this. So without them having an idea and, and helping me understand what what all the issues were and who to contact and how to get in touch, you know, it certainly would not have gone nearly as smoothly. So I just wanted to echo that. Um, and then on, on the topic of um, well, I guess I'll go on the topic of, of COVID since we're talking about it. Uh, the town office building is continuing um, to prepare for reopening um, of, of in-person. I think the, the current idea is trying to do in-person by appointment only. Um, and, and we're talking about how that would work. Uh, we have counters installed, we now have desk shields. Um, and I think that what we've been discussing is um, trying to do that by appointment only reopening um, after the week of early voting for the primary, which is the last week in August. Um, so either right before or right after Labor Day. And what we were talking about is, is developing a process where people want to come in they can we were still encouraging online and over the phone business as much as possible using the dropbox um, but purchasing a more accessible dropbox um, that can take larger packages for, for the rear of the building um, and how the flow would work and then what, what we sort of talked about a little bit and and i think that again this is a testament to staff is feeling like we don't, if somebody comes in and we're able to accommodate them, we don't want to force them to make an appointment. So create a procedure where if staff is available, they call in and we let them in the building, um, even if they don't have an appointment. It, it, if the person they're looking to meet with um, can make the time just as if the, the building was open regularly with the understanding to the public that the best way to ensure that somebody comes to the door and is available is to make an appointment. Um, and that's how we would be able to limit the number of people in the building um, and make sure that everybody's safe and, and still able to conduct business. Um, and we'd still be doing remote meetings at that time, but, you know, slowly starting to get back to um, in-person meetings and, and for those things that can't be done remotely. Do we have to look at maybe um, installing like a doorbell or something out there and then maybe like some cameras so that you guys can see, you know, you know, if we, if we get to that point. Yeah. So I, I think what we were hoping to do is 
at least in the initial phases is again encourage people to call and set up a time and then call when they actually get here and um, certainly if people don't have access to a cell phone they can knock and say i have an appointment and, and we try to accommodate that but the idea would be when you park you call you say i'm here um you come to the back door i you know for contact tracing and, and everybody's safety we would do we would ask people to fill out um you know a contact information in case somebody does you know somebody in the building is is infected and um <laughs> We would ask them to self-certify that they don't have any of the COVID symptoms, um, just just like all employees will as well on a, on a daily basis. Um, so it's sort of a mutual protection idea. Okay. Um, so that that's what we're we're talking about in the town office building, and then uh, the library is looking at uh, computer use by appointment only. Um, starting August 1st for limited hours. So um, there, I think it's a, there's a time limitation and I think only a certain number of computers and they're gonna be wiping all the computers in between each use. So again, trying to get back to some semblance of normalcy um, sooner rather than later. But that's nice. what their plans are. And then the, Last thing that I wanted to mention was last Tuesday night, um, we had a community dialogue on Sunderland policing that, that Chief D. Metropolis hosted. I think we had about 14 or 15 uh, residents and it's recorded and uh, FCAT posted it on the YouTube channel. Um, and I think it was, a, it was a really great conversation. There were um, concerns about or questions not uh, questions about how how Sunderland officers are trained on the use of force um, prevalence of force there were there were specific questions and I think it it was a really great opportunity I think the chief did a wonderful job explaining um, what the training requirements are uh, how that comes from the state down um, how how often the training happens, um, explain intricacies of the use of force policy that Sunderland has um, and how they continually evaluate uh, whether or not there's a threat and how officers are, are not allowed to use any more threat than that is presented to them. So if somebody is just yelling at them, then all they can respond with is, is words. You know, you, you try to get compliance and only when there's resistance um, are, are officers legally allowed to respond um, with force. And so my impression coming out of that uh, was that the residents really appreciated the frank conversation and getting those answers. I heard a lot of, thank you, Chief. I, I understand it better. I feel a lot better now. Nice. Um, so I, I think it was it was a really positive experience, um, hopefully both for the Chief and the people who were able to participate. So for those who weren't able to, to be on there uh, and have questions about that those types of things, um, I encourage you to check it out on YouTube. That's great. And, and I, I really wanted to make that. Unfortunately, I couldn't, but I noticed right around the same day was also the day that uh, the news came out about um, the state and their, their, you know, their approach to it, too. So that, that kind of dovetailed very nicely into that and then the things that, that we're trying to do at the state level to address some of those issues. So that's great. Those are my updates. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Um, I don't have anything specific, but I do want to mention that I'm sort of a plug for our um, town clerk. Everybody got cards mailed out for voting, so uh, you may want to check those out. And if you can, if you need to, fill those out and get those back. Because November, it will be here before you know it. So, and I know she's hard at work working for uh, getting all that stuff ready for our large presidential election that's coming up, so. <sighs> I'll, I'll turn it over to Tom because he's right right next to him, to me on the on the little display there. So, if um, you've got anything, Mr. Chair, I, I, actually, there's a lot of things happening. Mm. But if, if I could, sit, and I, I would just like 
a, a couple minutes um, to speak of the passing of Representative John Lewis. Um, you, you know, um, I, it, it, it's, it's, it's amazing sometimes how people are judged. Um, and and I, I think when you go back over a person's entire life, um, at the end of it, you can say that the greatest thing you could say is that the person was either a good man or a good woman. Um, and if you look at, at Representative Twist's beginning um, to his recent passing, I, I would say that, that if, if I could say anything about him, it would be he's a good man. To, to think in 1963, and for, I know there's not many of us that were born, but I, um, of course, I don't remember 1963, <laughs> not quite that old. But to, to think that that man um, was doing some of the things, um, riding, you know, riding on buses that he wasn't supposed to be riding on, walking across bridges, um, trying to get, trying to get out the vote uh, for people that should have had the right to vote, but were, were being excluded from voting, um, you know, getting a, and, and he fought for those goals his entire life, but he fought for them um, in, a, in a manner um, where, where he, he maintained his humanity. I, I find it incomprehensible, incomprehensible how a guy can do what he did and still do it in the manner that he did it with the injustice, injustices that he saw. Um, I, I, I just, I, I think it's a, it's a reflection of our, our country. The, the, and, and, and I'm talking about the good things in our country, not the bad, but good things that, that this country can aspire to, has aspired to. Um, and at the same time, I would say that we still have a long, a long way to go, but I hope we have more John Lewis's out there. Um, I, I hope that there's, I hope there's another generation of, of John Lewis and John Lewis, uh, the Martin Luther Kings, the, the John F. Kennedys, the, that, that can buy people and bring us together for all the things that we share um, instead of the few things that we disagree with. But I, I, I just think that um, I, he's lying in state now. Um, and I just, his, his whole everything um, that he stood for, I think we, sh we should try to emulate in our everyday life what he aspired for this country. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. You're welcome. I think he showed great humanity throughout his struggle. It's a, it's a big loss. Uh, any updates, Scott, at all? Or? Uh, we're continuing to negotiate with the police and union. Uh, the dialogue is uh, centered around our executive session discussion last week, and uh, we're looking for some responses coming forward uh, this Thursday. So we'll see. Great. Thank you. All right. And next up is we have what's labeled a first look at a friendly 40B proposal. Um, do you want to give us a little intro on that, Jeff, and then? Yeah, sure. Thanks. So um, the, the town was uh, approached by um, Attorney Reedy and the developer oh, about uh, potentially um, making a purchase of a property in town and t turning it into uh, a uh, housing development with affordable units and um, because the 
town is over the 10% um, subsidized housing index threshold, uh, any proposed 40B um, would would be subject to a, um, like comprehensive permit uh, review by the Zoning Board of Appeals. And so they sort of a, a first look, um, and, and this is my first time doing this, so that's <laughs> I don't okay. know. That's all right. But I, I figured it would be good <laughs> to do, do an introduction um, yep. and hear what the developer was thinking about and, and giving an opportunity of um, some feedback on, on how the, the select board um, felt about the initial proposal, what they would like to see as far as uh, housing in the town of Sunderland. All right, thank you. And, and just for those folks uh, we're talking, who, who might not know, we're talking about the, what was formerly the Cozy Corner Nursing Home on Old Amherst Road. That's a property in question. And, uh, is, is it Reedy? Is that how you pronounce it? Okay, just my try. Okay, so I'll turn it over to Tom Reedy there for a... Thank you, Mr. Go Chair. Good evening, everyone. For the record, Tom Reedy, an attorney with Bacon Wilson down in Amherst, uh, Peter McConnell's office, here with and on behalf of Jason Keats. Uh, and as, as Jeff mentioned, so we had had a discussion uh, with Jeff, reached out um, to try to gauge the town's interest um, appetite for a 40B project at 6167 Old Amherst Road in Sunderland. As you mentioned, Mr. Chair, it's the Cozy Corners Nursing Home, now defunct since you know, late 2018, early 2019. Right. Um, and it was one of those things where uh, Jason has the uh, property under contract. He does have a, a closing date scheduled for next month. So we're on a little bit of a tight timeline. We looked at several development options. We looked at subdivisions. We looked at uh, Dover amendment uses. We looked at your zoning bylaw. And none of those seemed to fit the bill for what Jason was looking to do, what the town bylaw would allow, um, or what he thought would be good for the town. And so we thought about a, a friendly 40B and, and I think friendly is the term used because it's, I guess, non-hostile. So you're above the 10% safe Harbor. And so it, it's not like certain other projects that have been um, uh, permitted in town uh, where, you, you know, you can, you can deny it. But I think what we'd like to do is to gauge the interest from the town through the select board, understanding that there is a long process ahead to actually go through the permitting approval for something like this. But before Jason actually signs on that dotted line, uh, we wanted to have this conversation. And so as, as you're familiar, it's a 10 acre site, um, two structures on the property, uh, parking, um, it was, there was a taking, I think back in 2019, uh, it was about $17,000 for the, for the uh, failure to pay taxes. It's been on the market for quite some time, as I'm sure you all know, uh, folks I know have kicked the tires and just haven't been able to get their head around what can they do. And so based on where I've been and what I've seen and heard from different developers, this seems like the most viable redevelopment or reuse of this property. So it's, it's village regi residential uh, for the first 400 feet. The back of the property is rural residential with the prime agricultural overlay. And I think what Jason would be looking to do is to use and keep the existing structures. Um, I upgrade the outside, new siding, new paint, um, make it look a lot more attractive. And then he would look to do work on the interior of both of the structures. And I think ultimately, it would produce 29 units. So there would be six units in the existing house, we'll call it for lack of a better phrase, just to contextualize it for you. And then 23 units in the existing footprint of the nursing home. Uh, and Jeff, I don't know if you've got that, uh, the, the photographs of the existing or the floor plans available. If not, I can- Yeah, uh, what, uh, what do you want do me to have them. pull Maybe. up? I mean, maybe the, the proposed condition, so the, just the floor plan, there are two sheets of the floor plan. I trust everybody's 
pretty familiar with what it looks like. We can always mm -hmm. run through some existing conditions photographs, but you know, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar. And so as Jeff's getting it up, the proposal ultimately would be for 25% of those units. So, so I think there's 29 units, 25% of them is, or would be seven affordable units. Um, perfect, thanks, Jeff. So what you're seeing here is just, um, Jason has enlisted the services of Larry Tuttle, an architect out of Palmer to, to do a code analysis. So it's 34, I believe it's called analysis, which had been provided to the board. And um, Larry went through and, and tried to figure out how to kind of adaptively reuse this property without tearing it down and, and building something back up. And so what you see here is the nursing home reuse. There'd be 18 one bedrooms and five studio units in, in this building. Um, and then Jeff, if you want to bring up maybe the other one so we can talk about that quickly. Please. The other one is the uh, other property on the site, right? Correct. Yes, correct. So there's, I think there's, there's two tax parcels. If you look at your GIS system, they're, they're separated. Um, but this is that the house looking structure. I think it was used most recently for offices uh, for the nursing home. And so that has six units in it, five, one bedroom and one studio, um, or sorry, uh, four, one bedroom and two studio units. And so you know, before Jason takes on um, this challenge and the expense, because it's, it's going to be costly. I guess we wanted to get some feedback from, from you as the select board of, you know, is this something you could see yourself supporting? Obviously we have a, a long way to go with the design, with the, um, you know, the parking. I think there'll be minimal uh, site infrastructure modifications, which is, is nice. So we don't have to, uh, disturb a lot of dirt. Um, but we really wanted to get a sense of, is this something that the select board could find support for uh, or not? And if, and if it's not, then I think Jason probably severs the agreement and moves in a different direction. But through the conversations with Jeff, it just seemed like this, this is a, a good reuse of the property and, and the property which would otherwise hasn't been and probably wouldn't be redeveloped save for some zoning change which I don't know if the town has the appetite to do another overlay district or change the zoning, uh, the zoning map, or to, to change what could be allowed. Right now, this is a pre-existing non-conforming use. So if another nursing home wanted to come in here, they could. I've had nursing home clients look at it and they didn't think it was the appropriate time or location to try to take that on. And so kind of given the totality of circumstances, it seemed like this may be a, an appropriate reuse to get it back on the tax rolls, an improvement to the property to, to pay the back taxes and to provide housing and then affordable housing on top of that. So that's a, a little bit of where we see this going, but we'd love any feedback that you have. So, so Tom, this is Tom playing Kevin. Did, did you, have you read the town of Sunderland housing plan? I have not read the town of Sunderland's housing plan. So, so, so typically, when, when you talk about 40B, a friendly 40B, you would, look, you would read the housing plan, and then you would, try to, you would try to develop something within what the town has identified for housing. Um, personally, by looking at the plan, I agree it's a way to, to redevelop that. Um, that parcel of property, but why would it? I don't see what benefit it would be to the town to bring in. I mean, you're you're talking about four hundred square foot bedrooms. I mean, so that I guess that four hundred square foot would that would include the bedroom and the kitchen and and all yeah. that other all that other stuff. Yes, you know that that's more like a student dorm room. That that's not that's not where a working a working class 
um, uh, husband, wife, or uh, a, two partners with, with a child would start start out their life together. Um, and, and, that's, and that's the kind, you know, we, we, need, we need, you know, single family homes that, that, can, be, that can be occupied by um, family starting out um, or, or not even people starting out, start building equity. Um, so that they can move themselves up. I think if you look at our 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 apartment stock compared to the state, we're going to find out we probably have as many apartments percentage wise as the state of Austin. Um, and and we and and, a, and I understand there's people that are going to be that need apartments. I think the town of Sunderland has that market covered I personally I would look at trying to look at the housing plan and try to put something together that's that's uh, that's spelled out in the housing plan I would I would really like to work with a developer to do something like that versus just to bring in another market rate housing program I, that I don't see helps our town at all thank you personally, yeah, I, I think you had a good point, Tom, too. I mean, you look at the size of these, it, it seems like it's really geared more towards student housing based on the size of it than, um, than family housing. We, we, we need our, our, we need housing for a, a multitude of people. Um, and, and from, you know, and, and there's the people that need, you know, that need the uh, $650,000 house. I'm not one of them, but there's some people that need that. But there's also people that need affordable uh, apartments. We have those. Um, and I, but we also need places that families can, can start and they can grow at also. And, and right now, it's very hard to find places if your, your son or daughter, David, were to go out and get a um, get a job right now, it'd be very hard for them to find a place if they wanted a, a house, not an apartment, but a house, it'd be awful exactly. hard to find a starter house right now. Right. I think that's probably one of the biggest shortages on the whole market is affordable starter homes and ownership in that category. Right. <laughs> I, and, and I wish, and, and, and I, I wish I had the money to, 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 to to buy that and 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 have housing for humanities because housing I mean housing for humanities has said a many times that they'd build in Sunderland if, if they could find the land they just can't find they just can't find the land to do so so I I'd lo I'd love to be able to I I will I again that that's a, a great way for to, to people to start off and find an affordable home. If does, I, the town, does the town offer any uh, tax increment financing or any other subsidies, grants, et cetera? Because, well, I, I mean, I think we can probably agree that it's laudable to try to get folks into starter homes. There's just the economic reality of the, the cost of construction, you know, especially now. I think the latest thing that I saw from RK Miles was um, lumber prices have gone up 53% because of COVID. And so, I mean, that's just, it's the reality of the building of things. So is there a way to offset some of those additional costs through any town community preservation, anything like that in town? That, that, that's a good point. And, and when, when we did our senior housing, when um, the developer came to us and, and what we offered at that point is we offered a piece of property um, and, and, and we added a hundred thousand dollars to that afterwards. So, so yeah, the town, the town through either our CPA program um, or through the finances out of the town. Sure, we have ways to do that, um, and we could do that if it's a if it's a plan that we can all get behind. Absolutely, Tom. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think the the COVID price increasing in lumber. That's you know hopefully obviously a temporary thing. I think usually what kills what makes the 
economics of it is usually land prices because right off the bat, I mean, you know, that once your land price is expensive, that's going to drive everything else from there on. And that's usually the driver for expenses for that. Jason, did you want to say anything? I did. Um, thanks oh. everybody for, for having us, for having us here tonight. Um, for those who don't know me, I reside in Deerfield. I own Northeast Tree Care in Sunderland, and I also own and manage uh, about 75 units in the area. Um, Sunderland, South Deerfield, a little bit in Waitley. Um, of those units, um, we own uh, 55 North Main Street in Deerfield, which is where we just kind of turn that building around. That's where Bueno Isano is and Leo's table. So we just recently um, completed that. Uh, I just wanted to address the apartment size um, of, of what we kind of laid out because I can see that everybody is looking at it like uh, we're trying to attract students, which is actually 100% not the case. Um, and clearly in any scenario, if we did get approval, we couldn't discriminate against tenants, but uh, I would say 95% of our tenants are working class people and professionals. Um, of those, we have in 55 North Main Street in South Deerfield alone, we have 19 one bedroom and studio apartments. Uh, not one student there. They're all, uh, those are all just working professionals from the area. Some of those studios, um, are close to half the size of the ones laid out in um, the design that we did at Cozy Corners. Um, we have a massive demand, probably I would say 10 inquiries per week for one bedroom and studio apartments uh, from the same category of people, working class, um, people, professionals who are moving to the area. They, um, they can't afford um, I know somebody had said that, um, you know, there is affordable housing in Sunderland and I guess it just comes down to, you know, define affordable, you know, we're looking to produce, um, state, Jason state defined state defined. Sure. You that's know, understandable. We, we, we're, and, and for us, we, we can, we're going to, we're going to argue right with you on this one about that. We're going to agree with you, but we have to go by what the state defines as affordable housing. Cause I agree with you on that. On no, that's fine. And, and the case that I was just going to try to make is that uh, many of the students that come to us looking for housing are looking for four and five bedroom units. Um, that, right, that's right. where they want to be. They want to be in houses. They want to be together. Um, this is not, I just wanted to be very, very transparent that that is not the target market here. Um, we own Pioneer Valley Apartments up the street, which we've only owned uh, for not even a year. Uh, we've done a lot of work there to get that kind of cleaned up. Uh, those are two bedroom units. Um, as you add bedrooms, from my experience, uh, the more bedrooms you have, the more apt you are to attract uh, students. We, we do have a couple of um, four bedrooms with, stu with students in there. Um, but this, I just wanted to be very clear that that was not the target here. Like I said, we have a massive demand for these smaller units for just working class people. That's why um, we're just trying to kind of uh, supply um, some, some uh, demand here, you know, that that's what we've, we've got. And, and this just seemed like uh, a good site um, to, to give that a shot. So I can, yeah, so that, I guess that's my, that's my piece there. All right, thanks. Because I, I, I know that's a concern for a lot of people in the community. So thanks for clarifying your stance on that. Appreciate it. Do we have any other comments on that at all? Or Yep, go ahead, John. Thanks, guys. Appreciate yep. it. Uh, no John, John Pelletier, um, owner of 
the nothing on it current parcel <laughs> at 86 old Amherst Road <laughs> um, uh, with the with the hope of uh, building something in the next uh, two three years two years depending on how how COVID goes and such like that um, so first off you know I live in Newton Mass currently um, my wife and I live in a rather large unit um, it's a two plus bedroom um, our cat takes up one bedroom um, but uh, it's very important. Um, your, cat, one, right? your cat takes up wherever the sun is. That's what yeah. your cat takes Yeah, up. except on a day like today when she is just she just does not want to move and yeah. yep. roasting herself because it's so darn hot. Um, but uh, you know, when when my wife was finishing up her you know her graduate degree, I was working for the city of Cambridge at the time. We lived in a five hundred square foot um, studio in Boston mainly because it was a good distance. It was halfway. I could bike to Cambridge easily. She could easily take the green line to BC and finish her graduate degree. Um, and then we moved because, you know, she got a job and need them and we needed to move. But, you know, looking at the size of those apartments, it's certainly not, you know, geared towards students. And I would, you know, certainly echo based on my experience with housing in Newton and, and kind of seeing, seeing where that demand is. The, the one in, in studios and small units, you know, those are probably not going to be so ideal, especially for your undergraduate level or, or, you know, senior, junior, senior, if they're allowed to live off campus style of, of undergraduate housing, you never, you never know. But um, I think, you know, when you look back at the history of, of housing in the United States, and, and it's not necessarily it's a good thing or not, but you oftentimes did have, you know, families starting off in super small units, you had, you know, public health issues with them being in such a small unit, because you had four or five, six people, right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that was to some degree, and, and for a good part of our history, especially in the 19th century and 20th century, you know, how people started to build the equity needed to get into that starter home. And obviously, World War II helped and the GI Bill, Bill really helped to kind of move folks into that next level. But if, you know, a couple or even a single person is looking to save for that starter home, you know what, they're probably going to be willing to sacrifice, you know, uh, some of the the space and nice amenities that, you know, would, would work. Um, and so a, a smaller unit that is going to be, even if it is market rate, it's going to be market rate at a much lower rate because it's a smaller space. Um, that's obviously going to allow uh, more people to, to um, you know, obviously save more and, and get to a place where they can afford something a little bit more at a later point. And that obviously doesn't solve the, the lack of starter homes and the, the, the focus of everything new being built is much larger. But but nonetheless, um, I think, you know, that it's important, uh, you know, to think about these, especially early on. Um, and, you know, obviously, the, the longer the, the site sits vacant, right, the, the more cost there is going to be longer term, the more risk. I don't quite know when the building itself was built. Uh, I was looking at the property card earlier. But um, so you can probably let it sit for a couple more years. But obviously, there's going to be a, you know, a risk longer term. For something else and, and maybe sure you could fit you know a couple units down the side it's not a very large parcel in terms of in terms of frontage so I'm not sure what you could do well I guess if you combine both of them together you got some some movement if you wanted to do something more but um, you know I'm always a positive of, of a reuse and and whether this makes the most sense I don't know but um, I'd certainly think of this as a positive and and potentially something that would you know help the the area and, and for Sunderland itself whether it's focused you know more opportunity for senior housing you know my mom's downsizing she's moving to Northampton so she'll be close to me um, and, you know, she's building new and she's building something bigger, but, you know, she's going to be able to downsize into something that's about 500 square feet when she gets to that, you know, 90 is what she's expecting for. Right now she's 70 now. She's got a couple more years. Um, you know, so something smaller that still allows her to be independent, but she doesn't need that cold nursing home, you know, accessory at this point in time. You know, that's certainly valuable. So I think you, you would have, you know, potential with, with how it's proposed. Um, obviously, you could make a couple bigger here or there, cut a couple of those units. So you, you were making a couple of those real small ones, maybe a little bit bigger. But um, I think it's, it's uh, a worthy proposal, at least in my opinion, as a uh, almost nearby a butter. Um, and as a support of, of affordable housing in all ways, shapes, and forms, um, as it can happen. So just wanted to add my, my thoughts and comments to this as it came up, which is somewhat of a surprise. I wasn't expecting it. Thanks, John.
Appreciate the feedback. If I could, Mr. Chair, a couple of points. Yeah, please. So Jason and Tom, I appreciate you bringing the concept forward. Uh, the first is under the friendly 40B, I guess a question for consideration would be uh, the potential for taking a one or two of the one bedroom units and making them ADA compliant. And with that, that could help with points and grants. Uh, that could help us points True. internally as well as grants to be applied for, uh, whether they're in the original or in the house. Uh, that is something that was uh, we learned quite a bit about in the design and development of 120 North Main. That is, that, that's not necessarily senior housing, but still uh, ADA compliant could be very, very helpful. Um, that's, that's a big yeah. deal. Uh, the, yeah. second, the second uh, is more of a question, the first being a consideration. Uh, the second is those back acres. This totals ten full acres. Is there is this the is this the the whole ball of wax, or is there another phase with that space out in the back that's under consideration? Jason, I'll let you. I'll let yeah, you. I, we we have discussed nothing for the for the back uh, parcel. Everything that I've brought forth to Tom um, has been. Uh, solely the development of the existing two front buildings. Mm -hmm. um, when we looked, when Tom and I initially discussed uh, uses for the entire property, um, there was discussion of a larger development, um, but that was basically more of a plan B with this being my main focus was to repurpose the buildings with a low impact um, everything basically gets cleaned up, uh, reused, um, and, and put back um, on the map, leaving leaving essentially leaving the back untouched. So, um, so we didn't discuss anything for the back after um, after initial discussions, just because this was my obviously my main focus um, to bring forth before anything else. It's just great, like. Part of that might be needed for parking too, right? We will need some additional parking, yeah. Yeah, based on, I don't know how much, but okay. All right, thank you. So if I could again, Mr. Chair, yeah. it's important to bear in mind as we go about any kind of discussion in here that to Tom's point earlier, um, and Jason, I appreciate your, your defining with those studio spaces as well as John P weighing in, um, about you know how people move through the housing uh, system, you know Sunderland is basically fifty. Well, it's gonna be more than that now. Fifty-three ish percent rental stock. Um, of that, the vast majority, the very vast majority, is um, is market rate, and so there there is an initial response, certainly from my own perspective, about geez, more rentals. And so you can see where that, that first like boom comes back. It's like, wait a minute, what are we talking about here? But thoughtful uh, and well executed is something that the, the board and the town in particular uh, has supported in the recent past. So I would just put that out there. That's why some of the, my own response and my own quiet was looking at the player. For, I live down the street, by the way, and Jason knows this. So, you know, how many more cars does it bring? Uh, all that, all that stuff that's associated with another bunch of rentals. It beats a place that's being overgrown and is being taken back by nature slowly but surely. I totally get that and I appreciate that. Um, but that initial response in talking about more rentals in the town of Sunderland, which is to Tom's point, second only to the town of Boston, we have 52 plus percent based on our last housing plan submission approved by the DHCD. Um, it's a lot of rentals in this space. So that's, that's, that's the reason, uh, I think certainly from my perspective for the initial silence, uh, and for the lines of questioning, uh, with respect to a friendly 40 B friendly being the operative term, you know, there's some middle ground somewhere. We understand the economics. We're, we're not all, we're not, as, as Tom has said in the past, we've fallen off trucks, but not the truck today. Right. So, um, but that said, um, it's interesting, and I, I'll, I'll leave it at that and stop my 
my dissertation, although I want to finish with in <laughs> summation. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Did you guys have any other questions for us at all or at the moment? Hey, um, any, any other guidance? I mean, I'm getting, I, I heard Mr. Fadenkevich in, in his suggestion of reviewing the housing production plan and suggesting yep. that starter mm -hmm. homes were, were the better use, but I frankly, after looking at this property, don't know that that is going to be the use of this property. And, and so I guess we're at a point where we need to fish or cut bait. And I don't know that I've heard, and I, I want to hear, um, there is a project here if we can work together, or I want to hear there's no chance. I, I haven't necessarily heard that completely in either direction. And so I was just looking for, and Jason, I don't know if you have, but, but no, I have yeah. Um, and so I'm just looking for any more guidance that the, the board could give before Jason either fishes or decides to cut bait. Yeah, I, it, I mean, it's kind of hard for us. It's at the very early stage. I mean, you know, it, it's kind of hard for us to to really go. I, and that's why I think we're sort of going down the middle there in that sense. You know, we, we need to see some more information. And I think there's certainly possibility that we can work together, obviously, on something. Um, you know, and, and in the end, it, it's a it's a private sector development. So in that respect, so. Well, okay. a friendly a, fr a friendly forty B, uh, Jason or Tom. I'm sure you participated in a, in friendly or maybe even not friendly forty Bs. They're 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 rife with their own. Uh, if you're fishing in those waters, they're rife with their own currents. I'll piggyback on your analogy, right? Yep. Uh, you know, asking asking a, a select board in a public meeting on the first pass, if you what's our, what's your sense? You, you know, you're not going to get that. Cavalier, it's just, isn't it? It's just not going <laughs> to happen. So you know. I think yeah. everybody here has spoken has spoken their piece at this point, and um, I, I would suggest that I would suggest that maybe there's an opportunity to continue dialogue. But you're not going to get a decision tonight. I'm going to go out on a limb. Yep, that, that is perfect. What what you've yeah. all given yeah. is exactly what we were looking for. Good. All right. Okay. Well, all right. Thanks thank for you, coming, guys. Much for the time, we really thank appreciate it. Oh, I think I think Tom has a comment. No, I and 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 we have been involved with 40 Bs, and and yep. and and I know. Fuck, we we have we have twelve plus years, thirteen, fourteen years of of dealing dealing with one 40 B that that um, basically, if you looked at what was presented originally. To what now it I would say it started out at 13 houses and it ended up as 150 apartments right so I, I, I don't you know you, you have right now so so you know to me if you came in and said okay this is our plan we're gonna put you know we're gonna knock the house down because that's 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 we're gonna knock the house down so that we can expand the parking we're gonna do this we're gonna do that and you had definitive plans on on paper that we could look at, and 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 I'm I'm very interested in Jason's um, comments that it's young professionals. I would bring those young professionals into a meeting and have them talk to us, Jason. Um, I can just say that in in our experience, and and we kind of know who's living in the apartments in in the town of Sunderland. Um, that our experiences may be a little bit different than yours. You, you talk about a house, you talk about a, a students want to be in a house with four or five apartments. Well, if I look at a house that you have next door and it's yellow, there's one, two, three, guess how many apartments are there? So I'm, I'm saying that, well, that's a, that's a frat house, you know? So, but, so I, I understand what you're saying, but when I look on the piece of paper, I'm seeing something totally, totally different. Um, so I, I would, you know, and, and I'm sure that as if you're looking for um, starter home for, for people, I'm sure that there's certain things that, that would be put in those houses that a student would not necessarily want or wouldn't be looking for in an apartment. And, and I, you know, 
and I don't I don't see that defined in the plan that you have presented. So if you put that in the plan and say, look, this is we want, and and and, and don't get me wrong, I think if you're if you're, if you're trying to if you're trying to look for that first time home buyer or not necessarily a home buyer, but for someone to get their foot in the door and 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 um, to start start off start their life or whatever they need to that they want to better themselves or or a place at least to start affordable housing. Um, you probably know what to put in apartments, but right now I'm just seeing lines on a piece of paper of a 400 a 400 square foot apartment. And and I'm very I know the inside of Cozy Corner nursing home very well, so I know what it looks like. Um, so I, I'm just saying. But if you put those on a piece of paper, but those aren't on the piece of paper right now. Those are your words. That that's something that we have that we're not seeing on 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 paper. That's what I would want to see before I could make before I'd really want to get down and start talking brass tacks about a friendly 40 V. In, in my opinion, I. In, but if, if that's what you want to do, sure. Let let then put put something on paper. Let's see it. And let's and and bring people in. Show us and make their case. Absolutely. I would, I would, I would, if I could, Tom, piggyback on that. You know, we fought a 40B for a decade and we helped usher a friendly 40B in, in about a three year window. And I say three years, I, I understand development schedules, but this is, this is senior right. housing with a public entity. You know, there's a fundamental difference between, you know, a combative and a, and a, uh, and a friendlier role. So we can fight pretty well. We still lose sometimes, but <laughs> you know, we can also get things done when it's truly friendly. Right. And, and Scott, I, I would just like to, I would just like to add um, in, in our, in our other 40 B um, we were told from day one, it wasn't about student housing. Oh, that lie. Mm, yeah. Okay. And, and I would tell you now that the first, that if you go on the UMass uh, housing uh, and you look at what's for rent, you're going to find you're certain gonna find thing through the <laughs> UMass housing. So I'm just saying that we've been there. So yeah, right. And, and and we started off renting apartments, and then then as it, we find out that we're not no longer renting apartments, but we're renting beds. Right. So we we we've been there. Right. Um, that's why, that's, that's why Jason and Tom, that's why we're just asking to put stuff on the paper and, and, and we, you know, we will deal with what we see on paper. Mm -hmm. um, but we, there's reasons why we think what we think because we have seen it before, unfortunately. That's very fair and great context. We yes. really appreciate it. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thanks for coming in, guys, or coming on, I should say. Sure. <laughs> Tuning me. in. Yes, that's right. Thanks. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Um, and I, you know, as we kind of slid past it, do we have any general public comments at all? Because usually we have folks in the room, so it's a little more obvious. But I think <laughs> just in case. <clears throat> all right. And our last item is discussion of revenue benchmarks for employee wage adjustments and COLAs. Because I know one of the things that we had commented that we uh, had voted in those items conditional on, you know, obviously. No, and David, I, I hope yeah. we put on, on a regular on a regular thing. You know, I, I hope we don't lose that. You know, we made an agreement with our, our, our employees. So we exactly we uh, I yep. although I wasn't I, I wasn't uh, I wasn't totally um, I was very disappointed when I see that the state is what three point three billion dollars billion dollars behind on their revenue. I saw right. that. That's, yeah. that's that's this that's this reporting period. That's not yes. cumulative. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, so I, I was I I, I and, and I I still don't I'm I'm concerned I'm concerned on how that's going and and how we're spending money. But I hear a lot of say don't worry about that. We got COVID money. That's that's, yeah, that's that's not regular revenue. <clears throat> yeah. So, could I weigh in, Mr. Chair? Yeah, please. And and that is in and around this. We we should 
for a host of reasons, set at least a time to check in. Tom, I appreciate the fact that we have to have a level yep. of awareness, but we should have a time where we make these decisions. And it seems to me that um, second quarter, end of second quarter is our, obviously our mid-year point. Yep. We should understand from the accountant and the treasurer collector, but also where we are post audit uh, with projected, not submitted, but projected uh, free cash. And that should help us with our guidance. That puts us out in October ish, maybe early November for the projections and the submittals. If we're reconciled and we're built out, if our administrative team is on their B game, not their A game, but their B game, <laughs> we should be done by November. Right. Because I, I was thinking like we do need some kind of concrete benchmarks yeah. to look yeah. at and say, okay, yeah, we're in good shape or we're not, or we're almost there. And right. then so that we know, okay, and we've got enough information to make a, a, a decision to say, all right, right let's, let's roll with it. Yeah, so the appropriate, well, the, it, all of that is fine, but we don't know what's going to happen with the school either. Understood. Right. And then hopefully by October, November, we'll have an idea of what's going on by then. May, well, maybe, maybe. Yeah. I, I, or or I, the uh, adjustments that were taken, right, Tom? I mean, you can start, right. but then you're doing adjustments. Yeah. I, I, well, I, I, th I think it's important that the school gets it right. And, and I think they're, you know, when I looked at their plan and, and, and you read their plan, there's, there's been a lot of effort that, that has gone into that, that plan. Um, right. And, 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 <clears throat> I, I, I and, and and now, but but you know, you you put a plan together, as we all know, and then all of a sudden, you know, you go into the first day of school and something something changes. Uh, I right. just, you know, I, you know, are are we going to be hiring extra staff? You know, are they going to are they going to have to need extra staff in the school? And I I hope they do. If they if they need extra staff, um, to to maintain their social distancing. You know, or, or you know, who who knows what kind of stuff the, the kids are going to come back to school with? You know, and, and I mean mentally, you know, maybe there's going to be extra things that the, the kids. So I I am concerned about the school, and and and, and I, I I hope that you know, and this this goes back to Reagan or Clinton or one of them that no kid is left behind. I hope we don't leave any kid behind because of this COVID stuff. You know, and right. and and I. And I, I, I believe every kid is important. Um, and, and, and so I, I hope that, I hope that we can, we can address those issues. I don't know how much it's going to cost Steve. I really don't. Right. And, and to, to a point you made earlier too, you know, we can, we can do all the planning we want, but with a situation like this, there's a lot of elements that are simply beyond our control. You know, all, all, all of that said, we made a commitment at town meeting to checking in at the midpoint yes. of the year to see what our revenues were. So we could right. either follow through with a commitment to our staff or let them know we don't have the revenues and they don't get the colas and, and wage increases. Right. This discussion yeah. should be centered around really in my mind, where are those benchmarks and what is that timeline? Yep. Exactly. Cause I, and I think we can at least do that because we'll have an idea by then. And, and I agree with you, Scott, but I think it's more than just, Revenues. I think it's. I think there's expenses enter into it also. You know, you, totally. I, I totally your, agree. Your 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 revenue may hit certain marks, but your expenditures may may be out there. Right. Know? I think maybe call it a balance sheet review rather than just a you know the revenue yeah, side of it. That's fair. Yeah. Well, I I would I would think we sh we should be seeing from the treasurer, collector, accountant, the, our financial team. We should be seeing we should be seeing what's coming in on a monthly basis, right? You know, uh, take our, a pulse. Then I, I I would think our local receipts we should be repeating. You know, by the way, do we know what the state budget is yet for uh, FY? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a comedy show now. <laughs> oh, but, but that's, what, that's what I mean. We don't even we don't right. and, and 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 look, David Scott and I have been doing this for a while. Scott and I for a longer than Davey mm. that being said it concerns me because if you told me 10 10 years ago that we would have a budget voted on at town meeting and not not having it been approved 
by the governor and the state legislators. What do you think, Scott? Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> we would right. we would tell, we would tell we we would be telling you that that was impossible. Right. So so I I I, I and 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 also it, it's funny because I've seen some some of our local communities and we've talked to some of the local or I have talked to some of the local selectmen and they are talking about going month to month or twelve you know because you're theoretically you can do twelve month you know one twelve one month budgets mm -hmm. yeah. and people thought that was the answer. Guess what? There's not no. too many those around anymore. No, Be because there's so much uncertainty that goes with a one month budget. Right. That they so yeah that opportunity to do you know a 12th one twelfth budgeting was just rife with with problems i i'm, I'm concerned I, you know we we have you know we 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 all thought that we were going to go in the fall time and we'd have another town meeting to fix it anybody want to vote on a uh, anybody on a bet on a fall town meeting to fix budgets i i don't think they will have a budget by no, I think I think you're right about that, Tom. The, the, no. the budget as of right now is not even a conference, let alone anyway. Conference. Yeah. I don't even think it's been put on a piece of paper. So, but I, um, that said, it is it is important in the time of uncertainty to at least have some kind of places we want to check in. So maybe Jeff, if we could get the the monthly uh, revenue pieces locally, right? see how that is working out. And then okay. as we go about submitting either post audit, you never, never count on post audit, but audit gives you kind of like a, you know, finger in the air, winds blowing that way. We unpaid bills and other things um, that may help us. And then lastly, when it comes time to have the fall uh, property tax collection, the estimated one, how that goes. Those are three areas that we can look at. And then finally the formation of that schedule a that says, okay, here's all the town's numbers we're submitting based on our receipts and our end of year closing. And at least Tom, that's a, that's a, that's a point where we, we have something that's solid and then balance that against whatever expenses came up from August through November, early December. So, Scott, what, what's our total, so when you break it down, what, what is our total revenue from state, state funds? I'm not sure. Yeah, in other words, yeah. So, so I guess, I guess I, I, what, what 28, I would say. 28, I'd say 28-ish. Uh, and, and I think that's right. So, so, so what I would do, I think what we should ask Jeff to do is to look at the revenue sources that we've had over the last five years mm -hmm. and and show us you know what percentage from you know for from the state mm -hmm. what percentage are we get from local receipts what percentage right. we and you can even break the local receipts down more to to uh um property tax excise tax whatever mm -hmm. well, i see a pie chart coming jeff well it, it could be a pie chart Dave. yeah because it's like, a good way to break it up like, I like bar graphs, but pie charts are good. Okay. We can do both. It's but, blueberry but, season. We could make pie. <laughs> I did that yesterday. <laughs> well, do you, know yeah, you, I mean, hey, do you know what you get when you divide a pumpkin circumference by its diameter? Pie. Oh. Pumpkin pie. Pumpkin there you pie, go. Yeah. Ah, well played, well played. I'm looking for that sound effect button for the rim shot on my keyboard. I don't find it, though. <laughs> but, but but, it, to, but, it, yeah. but 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 we should we, we should I guess we should probably look at that and that would help us that yeah. would help run through where, what we're looking at you know because right, we do need Agreed. some concrete waypoints that we can utilize. Yeah. So what percentage yep. of our what percentage of our revenue comes from from our property tax? What percentage comes from state? What percentage comes from whatever? Yeah, I think it'd be good to have too. I think just. And that kind of gets back to some of the goals that we talked about, Jeff, like kind of making the budget stuff a little easier. And this is the kind of stuff, too, that we can also put out on the website for folks that they can look at because it is a nice, it is a handy piece of information to have. And it helps people understand the budget better and just how things work financially. Yeah, I was actually so. looking at one of those solutions today, and I think they do have pie charts of exactly that type. Um, 
only yep. through fiscal year 18. So I'm going to, I still have a little bit of homework. I can't totally cheat. But, That's at um, uh, local, local services. It, yeah, it, it, yeah. I, I'll look it up, but I think it, it does. It breaks it down. Yeah. I don't know if it goes into excise tax or the, the different types of local receipts. It just qualifies it as local receipts, but yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, but, but like, but it, it, it helps you find out where your volatility is. Like if you only get 20% of your budget from the state, well, okay, we can watch that, but there's certain other things that we need to watch to look closer. So, Correct. Right? And, and I think it's fair to say that some of us here like love to nerd out on budgetary stuff and things like that. So, Well, you, I, I just know that you wouldn't want to know 20 years ago what percentage of our local education was paid for by the state. Hmm. Well, yeah, I think we need that in a pie chart, in a, in a nice bar chart no, to show you folks. Wouldn't, you wouldn't want to see it. That's all yeah. I mean. Just makes you mad. Mm. Uh, it doesn't matter. It, it, sh I, it, it doesn't. No, actually, Scott, it doesn't make me mad. It makes makes me wonder why our state has changed. State government has changed its priority mm. away from away from supporting local education and education as a whole. It, it's sort of a total trickle down thing. The, the federal government has shifted onto the states, and the states have shifted onto local areas. The burdens. Yeah. Interesting pattern. Yeah. So do we have enough to at least start looking at that, Jeff? Yep. Okay. All right. Um, hey, and I think that was actually our last official topic for the evening. Um, I see our next meeting will be Monday, August 10th, right here on the same exciting Zoom channel. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that's about it, unless anybody has anything else. And if not... Uh, Motion. I guess we could take a motion to adjourn. Motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. All right. All those in favor for adjournment? Aye. Aye. Aye.